Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank you all for joining us today for our new series of webinars focused on high-speed networks. Today, Nick Peone will introduce some of our upcoming topics and discuss some of the challenges in moving from a 1 gig network to a 100 gig network. My name is Jessica Petrohoy, and I'm the marketing coordinator at FiberOptic.com. FiberOptic.com is a leading provider of fiber optic products, training, and rental equipment. Optical engineers are facing increased challenges of upgrading the bandwidth speeds of their networks. If you are building a new network or managing an existing network, understanding these challenges can save your company time and money. At this time, I would like to introduce Nick Paoni. Nick is one of our senior sales engineers and our sales manager at FiberOptic.com. Nick has years of experience with switching and routing, network security, DWDM, CWDM, and networks. When Nick is finished, we'll be taking questions from the GoToWebinar chat box. Thank you again for joining us today, and at this time, I will turn the presentation over to Nick. Hello, everybody, and thank you for attending. I'm looking at the attendees list, and I'm, uh, I'm seeing quite a few people here that uh, I've dealt with and worked with over the, over the years, so I, I definitely appreciate you guys hopping on today. Um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna do a cover a broad overview of uh, some of the network challenges. Not all, as, as you know, there's there's so many challenges out there. You know, when you're uh, working with the network, anywhere from uh, one gig to 100 gig. But we're gonna talk uh, talk about some today, and then uh, I am gonna take questions at the end, and uh, we'll go from there. The massive growth growth of the internet demand. You know, his, uh, his consistently driven technology to scale at extreme rates of bandwidth. Uh, to keep up with this bandwidth expansion, networks have to expand along with them. Um, through this series, we will cover a broad spectrum of transport technologies, solutions, and equipment used in today's networks from the, from the physical layer to the network layer that address modern growth requirements. Um, but first, uh, get into briefly who we are. Uh, FOM, the fiber optic marketplace, fiberoptic.com. Uh, we are located in Briningsville, Pennsylvania, and we just had a very big debate, me being from New York, of how to actually pronounce the name Briningsville, because uh, I guess the G is silent. But uh, for 15 years, over 15 years, we've been helping out uh, our customer base with fiber optic components, act active and passive equipment, and then other equipment such as fusion splicers, power meters, and OTDRs. We also offer uh, a, a wide variety of services uh, through our partnerships with many, many other companies. Um, if you're interested in more of this, please contact me directly. We'd love to hear from you. We offer product management, consulting, fiber characterization testing services, uh, fusion splicing. Uh, we also have an EF&I platform to engineer, furnish, and install. And we also offer uh, on-site classroom, uh, classroom training around the world. Here's a map that's going to show you, um, you know, the training locations internationally as well as nationally. Um, you know, we, we are here in a uh, Brightingsville, Pennsylvania, but as you can see, we are all over the world with our classroom trainings and, uh, and uh, services performed. Probably you might be saying, well, who's our customer base? Uh, this slide here is just to, just to give you a kind of a brief overview. Um, we're working with the big carriers such as CenturyLink, um, all the way down to, say, a local hospital. Uh, these are just a handful of, of logos that you may or may not recognize. So carriers such as CenturyLink, we're working with installers, we're working with universities, with hospitals, and I was on the phone with a car dealership locally here last week uh, helping them uh, diagnose some, uh, some, some packet loss they were experiencing. And I apologize here that you have to uh, stare at my ugly mug, but uh, if you're wondering who I am, uh, this is my background. I'm not going to get into it too extensively, but um, I started off as a structured cabling installer years and years ago and I got into the fiber characterization test engineering side of it um, and it's kind of history after that I went into routing and switching uh, and I specialized in cyber security but I ultimately missed the uh, the optical side the transport side and you know the uh, the physical layer so uh, that brings me back to where I am today I also like to introduce you to RAD RAD is an another one of our, uh, our partners we work very very close with and uh, real quickly you know, they were founded in 1981. They're an anchor of the $1.2 billion RAD group, which I'll get to in a second. And RAD offers a wide variety of equipment utilized in today's next generation networks, uh, which we will be featuring um, in, in this series moving forward. You can see, I mean, they're, they're not a small time company, 1,000 employees, 31 offices. Um, they're, they're a pretty large company. 
this to give you a better idea of uh, of the rad group you know I, I just mentioned rad was the is the anchor of the rad group these are all of rad's companies um, and we are working hand in hand with every single one of them uh, working with you know installations to configurations to uh, you know to helping you build those next generation networks so whether it's uh, CIPRI, DAS, uh, CWDM, DWDM, uh, DDoS, SCADA, we have our hand in all of that. And you know, I'd welcome you to uh, ask any questions as we move out, move through the series of uh, of the WebEx. Let's do a quick overview, and I may have jumped ahead of myself here with some of the topics. Um, over the course of 2015, we will be covering SCADA, CIPRI, DWDM, DAS. Um, there's been a lot of excitement about can you actually hack fiber? Uh, that's going to be a big one. Um, MPLS versus Carrier Ethernet has been there's been a lot of requests for that, and uh, a, a very good friend of mine over at CenturyLink, uh, I believe she is on the call here now, um, had asked for protected wave versus diverse wave. Uh, I guess she's got a got a customer driving her nuts and won't take a, a diverse wave and is really pressing her for a protected wave solution. So we will be getting into that too. We're going to get into some scenarios too. I, I really want to make this as uh, you know as, as educational as possible. Um, this is an example of one of the scenarios we will be be visiting. Um, you know, the network is uh, is non-packet, but the customer needs uh, to transport Ethernet IP traffic. What do you do? The reverse side of this, uh, the network is packet, packet Ethernet or IP, but the customer needs to transport legacy traffic. Again, what do you do? Uh, I'm not going to get too much into this because this is going to be a future topic, but I do want to try to include real uh, real world scenarios as much as I possibly can. One of the considerations we have to take into uh, you know in, into effect here is uh, ORL. Um, ORL is the sum of all the lights set in one direction of the transmitter. Um, you know that's it can be that's including your connector pairs, your fusion splicing. You know ORL is measured in dB. So back when I was in the field. Uh, as a characterization engineer, uh, AT&T spec was 0.5 dB per connector pair, and I believe it was 0.22 per splice. So this is going to help you assemble a lost budget, which I'll get into uh, briefly here in a second. But if you have, uh, say, hypothetically, you know, th four uh, four connector pairs at 0.5 dB each, you're going to figure out you're going to do the math and figure out what your lost budget is with just your connector pairs. Attenuation. Uh, this is another big one. I know there's a lot of optical folks on here today. Uh, attenuation. You know, this is going to be dependent on the wavelength, the fiber type, and the distance. Um, so let, let's talk about 1550 here. Uh, if if you got a, if you're utilizing 1550, and we'll say it's it's uh, in, in a an eight kilometer hop here that we that we are uh, you know we're turning up or we're upgrading. Be a 0.25 dB of loss. You know, times that eight kilometers is going to give you a loss budget of two dB, and that's not including what you're going to have on your connectors, your splices. Uh, you know, if you have splitters out there in the field, anything else, it is going to come into play. But uh, you really want to maintain a, a a really nice clean loss budget here. Here's a quick look at the uh, 40 gig specs. Uh, you know, utilizing what you, what you, we just talked about, the attenuation over the length, uh, the length of the span, I should say. Uh, you know, we're going to look at, at different standards here. So if you have a two kilometers over uh, single mode fiber, it's you're going to look at your 40 40 gig base dash FR is going to be the spec you're going to you're going to be looking at the standard you're going to be looking at. So this is very important um, as you pay attention to the specs because you know different distances as we get into different optics, they can't go different distances depending on the the speed you you want it to go. Whether it's uh, 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig. You know that's really going to come into play. Uh, let's look at our 100 gig specs here. You know, very very similar again to what we just looked at on the 40 gig spec. Um, let's look down here at you know you have uh, your 100 gig base CWDM4. Um, the clause that's your IEEE standard. Okay, um, not particularly not in that case, but uh, that column, um, your media type, and then your uh, you know it's a two k it's a two kilometer reach. Multi-vendor, you know, non-triple, triple non-I triple E standard. But again, we're going to base a lot of our, uh, you know, a lot of our network design or upgrade of what we're doing off of these tables here uh, to kind of give us the, you know, the spec we want to adhere to. And we do have to again take in that ORL and the attenuation in our loss budget. 
Last I want to talk about next is you know, types of dispersion. Uh, this, this does come into a big factor on your 10 gig, your 40 gig, which uh, I will get into here. Um, there's three different types of dispersion. We have our intermodal dispersion phenomena, phenomenon realized in multimode fibers as a result of light traveling with many modes or paths on a multimode fiber. I'm not going to get too much into this, um, this particular um, concept because I'm going to be covering this in a future WebEx. But I do want to talk about polarization mode dispersion. Um, you know, polarization mode dispersion is a, comes into play here. It occurs when different planes of light inside inside a fiber travel at, at slightly different speeds, making it impossible to transmit data reliably at high speeds. Um, a form of mo it is a form of modal dispersion where two different polarizations of light in a waveguide, which would normally travel at the same speed, they're going to travel at different speeds due to random imperfections and asymmetrics causing random spreading of optical pulses. Um, basically, it's a delay as a result of light traveling along different paths in a single mode fiber, that is. It's going to reach the opposite end of the fiber at different times. Uh, let's talk about what can cause uh, polarization mode dispersion, or I'm going to call it PMD for short. Um, there's intrinsic causes and there's an extrinsic causes. Uh, intrinsic is going to cause, uh, it's going to occur during the manufacturing process, causing non-circular non core. Um, you're really unable to remediate that uh, for the most part. Um, it is what it is. You're kind of stuck with it if that's the case. Um, extrinsic. Um, extrinsic outside factors, your wind, your vibrations. Uh, you know, I, I know uh, I have a Rick Slater from CenturyLink. I know he's on the call here, and him and I have had many, many conversations um, in the past about how the, the fibers back in the day was always run, run along uh, railroads. You know, and dispersion's a big deal there because when a train goes over the railroad tracks, it's gonna it's gonna cause a lot of vibrations. So that's gonna that's gonna cause some issues in your longer runs. So Outside of the wind, vibrations, environmental, your extreme cold, your extreme heat, and the temperature changes between the two. Uh, you know, I'm in upstate New York. Uh, you know, we love snow, so uh, it's not uncommon. You know, we get dumped down with snow, and then in the summer it's nice and warm. So there's expansion and contraction there of the fiber. It's it's gonna it's gonna come into effect with our dispersion. Um, the other extrinsic is the installation of it and the handling of it. Uh, I'm sure we've all been there in the field or seen it done, done in the field where something wasn't installed correctly or it's been handled wrong. Um, that will also be considered an extrinsic effect. Uh, PMD, it's statistical in nature. Um, it's random. It's not constant. It changes with time. Uh, think like your wind vibrations when a train goes by. It, it's uh, it's going to change. It's going to change with the conditions and it's also going to change with age. Okay? Uh, compensation for PMD. It's very, very expensive. It's, uh, it's possible, but it is expensive. You're looking at $100,000 plus thousand dollars per fiber. So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty tough. Um, what can you do? You can replace the fiber, which, again, expensive, complicated. Um, you know, I don't even need to get into if fibers run through four or five different pops in, this, in, uh, in say, New York City, uh, for example. Um, it's also not very timely to uh, replace the fiber. Uh, you could re-engineer the network and insert equipment. You know, that is also going to add a lot of money. Your equipment cost is going to be outstanding. Um, there is a solution, though. Uh, use the worst PMD fibers for the lowest bandwidth requirements. Meaning, if I have two pairs of fiber and we test all four for, disper for PMD, and uh, two of the four, they're, they're, it's, it's, not, it's not looking good. What I would do is I would allocate those fibers that didn't do, do so well to a set of customers that didn't require a high amount of bandwidth. Okay? When I would take the, the two that did look pretty good and I would allocate those towards my higher bandwidth customers. So there is workarounds with it. Okay? Uh, next we're going to talk about CD or chromatic dispersion. I'm going to call it CD for, for short. Uh, it's caused by the non-zero spectral uh, width of the transmitters along with the fact that different wavelengths travel at different speeds. So let's simplify that. You know, it's, it's a delay as a result in the varying colors of light traveling along a single mode fiber at different speeds that reach the opposite end of the fiber at different times. So your different colors are going to arrive and travel at different times, basically. Okay? Uh, unlike PMD, chromatic dispersion, it does not change. It is constant. Um, it will not change with temperature. It will not change uh, with installation practices. It, it's, uh, it's more of a constant uh, 
constant uh, you know, phenomenon than it is a PMD. So chromatic dispersion, it can actually be engineered. You know, there are many different fiber types. Uh, dispersion can be positive or negative. Okay? It's not always a bad thing in this case. Uh, most fiber networks, and I, I've never seen one that, that isn't, consisted of at least two different types of fiber, uh, making it virtually impossible to calculate the actual chromatic dispersion values. I mean, we need a rough idea, but the actual, it's, it's pretty tough. Okay? So chromatic dispersion does not fail. It's not like PMD. Um, CD does not fail. If CD exists, the, exceeds the threshold, it needs compensation, of course. Um, and we can use a dispersion compensation module to do just that. Um, fiber, it's, you know, it's basically what a dispersion compensational module is. It's fiber manufactured with a negative dispersion. It's uh, added to the fiber plant, usually near an amplifier site. Um, DCM, a dispersion compensation module, only compensates for one wavelength at a time. Uh, this, can, this can also lead to wavelength walk-off. Uh, compensation can be tricky and costly. You know, as I just stated, it uh, it's only compensates for one wavelength at a time. All right, what about a system now that we're using multiple wavelengths? 1310, 1550, uh, you know, multiple wavelengths. It, it can get costly. It can get costly quick. Okay? Um, go now to the harmful effects of dispersion. Um, I have a few listed here, but you know, the longer the distance traveled, the greater, greater possible effects of dispersion. Um, you know, and, I, and I talked to a, an engineer once upon a time, um, and you know, he said, well, I'm not really concerned with it too much because it's such a short hop. You know, as we really got into the OTDR, uh, the OTDR traces and got on what was going into the network, it was still coming into play. Okay? But still, the longer the distance traveled, the greater the possible effects of dispersion. Uh, dispersion limits a receiver's ability to distinguish those ones and zeros, those pulses. Um, you know, network engineers may, plan, may have to plan on implementing you know, different nodes for regeneration sites. Again, very, very difficult. So if we're turning a system up from 10 gig to 40 gig, you're talking late latency here. Okay? Um, if you have to implement a regeneration site, you know, I'm not even going to get into what the figures are for that what, and what that's going to cost. I, I'm sure all of you know, you know, it's, it's very, very expensive. It's timely. You know, your labor hours, everything, it's, it's going to cost quite a bit. Okay? So, if you look at your 10 gig to 40 gig, gig systems, you know, that is, uh, that it's really going to be considered latency. Now, 100 gig and higher, they are using coherent transmission systems um, that are more dispersion tolerant. The equipment is a little bit more dispersion tolerant. You know, is this still going to come into play? Yes, of course it is, but it's not as big of a deal on your 10 gig to 40 gig systems. Okay? Now, you may be asking yourself, well, how do we test for this? Where, what, do we, what, what would I do if I was a network engineer or the architect designing a new build, a 40 gig build or a 10 gig build or 100 gig build, whatever, you or whatever you're doing, um, what would I do? Uh, the answer to that is a fiber characterization test, testing. It's a, it's a slew of tests, um, OTR traces, insertion loss measurements, uh, return loss measurements. So we're going to help you build that loss budget. You know, we're going to have to sit down with you. We're going to look at that that uh, that route and say, okay, it's it's hypothetically 10 kilometers, 0.25 dB, based on uh, the wavelength we're using, based on the fiber type. We're going to help you build that loss budget. Um, you know, visual connection of all the of uh, you know the connector end faces, very important. Dirty connectors. You know that that ORL, it's not it's not going to pass. Um, chromatic dispersion testing, polarization mode disper dispersion testing, as well as spectral attenuation. Now. On your 100 gig system, as I just said, dispersion may not come into play as much. But the reason you'd need the services like this, and it, would, it will help you design your network, is uh, you, know, you really want to see what's going on out there. Because I, I have a feeling if it's a legacy system that you're upgrading, it probably predates you guys. So uh, I, I, know, I know you have the headaches of, well, this system is supposedly this, and it's not. With the characterization testing, it'll give you a great overview and a great map of what's actually out there. I've been in the field testing before, and I've found pops that, that the engineers, the architects, didn't even know existed. Okay, so this will give you a great 30,000-foot view of the, of the span you're working on, of the network you're working on. It'll help you look and see, all right, I have, I have connector pairs here, here, and here. I have splices here. Oh, well, that's a bad splice. You know, you can go send somebody out to re-splice that to improve your loss. Uh, another thing you could do is uh, a lot of times we find found uh, mechanical splices in a legacy network, and we all know that mechanical splices very lossy. 
Um, it's it's kind of a short short term solution, three to five year. Um, so you really you really want a, a thirty thousand foot view uh, of your network, and uh, it's going to increase your time to the street. Really, your turn up time. It's going to ensure ensure your customer is very happy too. Okay. So with uh, with that being said, you know um, I'm going to flip back over here. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a shorter WebEx today. Um, the, the, the next few coming up here are going to be a little bit longer, um, but this is really a kickoff. Uh, we did touch on a handful of challenges that we're seeing out there today, um, but I know there's many more. And I'm very curious to what challenges you're all facing, um, because I'd love to feature it here on this series. Um, reach out to me. I'll, uh, I'll give you my contact information again. So reach out to me, uh, email. LinkedIn, Skype, you can call me, however you want to get a hold of me, uh, that's, per that's perfectly fine. Um, we're also going to send out a survey after this. Uh, I hope you guys did enjoy this, uh, this, this WebEx, but there's a survey It's also going to ask again what you would like to see. So if there's a challenge you're facing, I really want to hear about it. I want to work with our team engineers here on it. Um, and I also want to, you know, want to see if there's a topic you would like me to discuss. Maybe it's not an issue you're seeing, but something you want to learn more about, send it to me. I'd love to hear from you. Okay. With, uh, with that being said, um, here is my contact information. I apologize you have to stare at my ugly mug once again. But uh, please, please uh, contact me, um, LinkedIn, Skype. You can email me, call me directly. I, I'd love to hear from you guys. So with that being said, I really appreciate everybody taking the time uh, to, to attend today, and I look forward to having some really great uh, WebExes moving forward.